Well, good morning. Um, I'm really pleased to be joined today by an old friend and colleague, um, Gavin Bellamy. Gavin and I go back a long way. We've both worked in challenging schools. We've both seen education at the rough end, and we both have fairly strong views about the best way of managing pupil behaviour. Um, Gavin has gone on to headship and working on turning schools round. He's now uh, a business trainer working with business leaders to improve the quality of their business and the communications within and beyond their businesses. So Gavin, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Could you just give us a, a little rundown of, of where you're at, your, your educational background and, and some of the things that you've tried and seen and done? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, education was my second life. I, I, I started off um, for a few years in um, engineering, project management, um, surrounded by a whole family of teachers, including my wife. And I made the inevitable move into education and was 30 years a teacher. And for some of that time, as, as you've mentioned, um, also in school leadership, um, secondary headship, associate headship, um, bit of a stint as um, an associate primary head teacher as well in a very challenging school. And um, yes, I've worked in many challenging environments and also to contrast in, um, you know, some much more successful schools. So I think that has helped me develop fairly balanced view of, over many of my ideas around education over the time, which has also changed with time as well. Um, one of the, my, my, my substantive headship was in a very challenging school in terms of behavior management when I took it on. Um, so very much focused at the time in turning that around. And, um, and dare I say, very successfully, we managed to achieve some notoriety for the impact on on that community at the time. Um, and I looked at how one can apply systems, effective systems into the classroom and to, to teaching to improve behavioral management. I stepped out of education about seven or eight years ago, um, initially went into um, consulting in education and helping school leaders and, and schools and various aspects before becoming a business coach. And I've worked with many, many business owners over the last seven or eight years, working on similar kind of challenges that one faces in school, um, team building, communication, effective systems, getting results, working with humans, individual people. And I came to a realization that a lot of the work that I was doing and my, um, my coaches, my business owners were doing, very successfully impacting on their businesses was directly applicable to education. And I went back and reflected on many of the things that I had done and what the system is currently doing and thought, hmm, I think some missed opportunities are happening here. Thank you. Um, you will be aware, um, because you've kept in touch with education and, and certainly our conversations, that there is a battle going on for the soul of behaviour management in, in schools. We've got a government policy. It's effectively a policy, if not spelled out in legislation, where um, we're taking the, the rules, routines, relationships approach, essentially building on the work of Cantor and Cantor, where there's um, uh, choices and consequences, there's responsibilities that pupils have. And that's become enshrined in teacher training in the core content framework. So every teacher is being trained and skilled in those approaches. And yet on the other side, we've got emerging um, advocates for what they're calling trauma-informed behavior management, where the teachers are looking at the child's background and what that might be affecting them. And certainly there's Twitter storms brewing, there's, there's people publishing articles, there's at last some research being done. But that's, that's we're in a, a little bit of turmoil with different people wanting to take different roads in that. What's your view, first of all, on, on the idea of children having very firm boundaries and consequences and choices, the language with which you and I are both very familiar 
Wow, what a big question. Um, my view has changed over time. If you were to ask me that question I am about eight or nine years ago, Mark, I would very much have been an advocate of consequence-based um, you know, teaching methodologies so that the children have very clear boundaries in which to operate and behave. Um, and I now... I, I would take a very different view on that now. I, I I believe that one of the problems in education, perhaps we can dig into this a little bit more through some of the questionings, and one of the problems I think with education is in many respects we are stuck in a 19th century model of education where the world has moved on so dramatically and, and education is one of those sectors, there, there are others in commerce where sometimes it's so hard to, to, to see the change. Consequences have always been an important part. Consequences and reward, I would say, have been a really important part in, in education. You know, teachers go into the classroom, they need to know where they stand and where the children are. And it doesn't really matter what the rule systems are. Some will be more effective in some cultures than in others, but they need to know that there is one. But I think, unfortunately, that's where the short-sightedness starts because we're only looking at one side of the coin. We're looking at the consequence system and the reward system and the behavioral system in which the child is operating but we're not actually looking at the whole child and we're not looking at the whole system. So I think I'd start my answer there. So if I'm reading you right, um, first of all, you think that school, school culture is out of line with contemporary culture and culture is the heart of the problem? When we're teaching a child, um, I think it was... Um, Covey that said, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people start with the end in mind. And I suppose this is where the big political debate is. What is the end in mind when we took, take a child into the education system and we put them out the other side? And for me, and this was very much part of my thinking and actually influenced my decision um, as to when I was going to leave the education system at that point is for me, the end in mind is to produce adults who are capable of functioning society and being successful by whatever their definition of successful is so if we look for example at the compliance side of things and say well look we're going to teach a child we're going to tell a child that this is where you go this is when you go there this is about how you behave a certain degree of reasonableness in all of this because we need timetables and we need you know strong cultures and, and good behavior because good behavior leads to good learning but there are limitations to that. What we're trying to develop is a child who is ready for adulthood in the outside world. So a compliance system on its own does not do that. Where do we go where, um, and perhaps educators think this is actually the case, which might be part of the problem, but where do we go when we put people into work that say, all you're ever gonna do is compliance. You'll be told what to do and how to do it, and you'll do it exactly in that way. That's not the creative, innovative industries that the world is definitely moving forward in right now. So what we need to be able to teach, in my argument, is a child that understands that there are systems with which to comply, but able to develop their individuality, but also able to communicate and be communicated to and understood as a human being. And I think many teachers develop that instinctively over time. They'll have children in front of them and they will instinctively adapt to who those children are as human beings, their behaviors, whether they're introvert, extrovert, focused on success, focused on relationships, all those kinds of things. But there's no mechanism or framework to actually help them address those children in relation to where they are. So I think that's a big problem in education right now. Where so if I'm hearing you right, you're, 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 what, what you're saying is we, we have a policy, but actually as teachers become more knowledgeable and more experienced, they're really not working within policy anymore. They're working much more relationally. The, I mean, you and I have both seen those teachers who never seem to have any problems with year nine on a Friday afternoon. And yet there are those that do. And it tends to be the more experienced who are responding more to the children as individuals. Experience is clearly a factor, but I also think intuition is as well. I mean, you and I have both come across, you know, young and inexperienced teachers that have also demonstrated great skills at handling um handing the children but you know mark you said you and i go back a long time I, I i know what buttons that if i pressed if you if you were a student in my class and i pressed some of your buttons i know how you would respond because i i know you quite well 
Um, and I think therein lies the problem. You know, the teachers look at teaching hundreds of children. I think, how can I possibly understand these, these children as individuals? I know what I'll do. I'll just fit them into the compliance system. I'll fit them into the behavioral system. And if something doesn't work, then the system can deal with them rather than actually recognizing that there is a whole skill set in understanding behavior. And it's not as complex as one might imagine to say, I'm working with a student. Let's go back to start with the end in mind. This child is focused on success. So they're motivated by success. So I'm going to choose my language and what I say and what I say around that. This child is shy, but motivated by relationships. So I'm going to, as a teacher, I'm, I can recognize that. I can measure that to what extent they are. So how am I going to adapt my teaching, my learning, my learning preparation, my grouping, my seating plans around that? Now, the problem with education um, policy is that people will look at the big ideas. Are we going to be compliance focused? Are we going to be child centered? And they put things into boxes. And I think therein lies the problem that when it comes to training and continual professional development, we use a sledgehammer to crack a nut and we don't, we, we don't look at these sort of more nuanced um, human interactions that are really crucial to our overall objective, which is preparing children for life outside school. That's why they're there in school in the first place. Some of our older listeners, viewers, will remember the, the steer reports into education. And, and I, I just remember one very telling comment um, that Alan Steer made in one of his reports, which was that um, actually 85% uh, of pupils will behave if, if the teacher is just doing a good job. And 10% could go either way. And there's 5% that we can't reach and uh, we, we need an alternative to. But I, I think part of what you're saying is that the teacher doing a good job is, is about that effective communication. Who was it who wrote the book, Good is the Enemy of Great? Oh, gosh, I can't remember that. No, I don't know. Can't either. Perhaps we'll come back with that and I'll edit that into the video. But I think part of the problem mm. here, Mark, is that that is in the interests of mass crowd control and... Um, hitting broad targets, whatever form they may take, and they've changed over time with schools and expectations by external agencies, we, we, we look at what is good, effective. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not taking the Ofsted approach here of, of finding a one-word answer to describe yeah. a school, whether it's outstanding, good, or et cetera, et cetera. But in, in terms of our relationship between the teachers and the students that we teach and wanting to get success, we want to be as great as we can be as teachers. Mm -hmm. And and I think policy gets in the way because, you know, the flavor of the day, I remember open plans teaching. Yes. And, and, and I remember that being the the answer. And, I'm you know, very difficult to actually put a case to say that it ever really was a sensible answer um, to education. So then somebody comes along, another education secretary with another idea. And we're talking about streaming and we talk about banding and we talk about all kinds of different things, what's appropriate for which student, whatever, but we're not having the discussions with the students at a human level. And if we can communicate effectively, I'm not just talking about teenagers here, I'm not just looking through my secondary eyes at this. You know, if we can imagine that we are equipped as a teacher to understand motivators and communication preferences at a fairly simple level with our students, um, and get the best results from them, how much more effective would it be able to do that with a really young child, with a four-year-old, with a five-year-old, and carry that through the education system? I genuinely, I said at the beginning, I think we've missed a trick. I think education has missed a trick. It's a massive claim to make, I understand that. But sometimes the skills that we can develop as individuals, the skills that I've developed working with business owners and school leaders, by the way, we've taken some of the work that we do into schools as well, um, just shines a light on what was missing when I was when I when I was in the education system. Um, I've, you I've keep looked... coming. You keep coming back. There's a recurring word, which is communication. Yeah. And the reason is this, Mark. Um, relationships is at the heart of teaching. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. I, I would I would be horrified if if anybody, you know, at, at, at sort of government level ever suggested otherwise. You know, we just put people into a machine and we turn them out the other side. That's the 19th century model of education. We open their heads and we tip the knowledge in and we see what see what sticks and what have you. Relationships are at the heart of education. At the heart and, and success, successful learnings and successful behavior. You know, what parent doesn't know? Um Actually, the problem is many parents perhaps don't know this, but part of our parenting skills is to understand our children and learn how to communicate with them effectively so that we can inspire them to, to be who they want to be. And it's, it's it's something we don't get practice at, unfortunately, but that's part of what we're trying to do. So relationships are at the heart of good behavior, good learning, motivation. At the heart of relationships is trust, and trust comes from effective communication. So... You are, are using the term communication. You and I are communicating at the moment. It's 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 a bit of a blanket term. Hmm. What would effective teacher pupil communication look like if uh, if I was going around a school and I could see that in Mrs. Smith's classroom there's really good communication, but in Mr. Brown's classroom there really isn't. What am I going to see? Well, let's let's start with some of the very basic um profiling that one might do with with people as human beings whether adults or child and, and that is to say are they generally extroverts outward going people or are they inward going people um and then if you know let's just take the hypothetical example of, of how we might see ch see children in the classroom um in regard to what we want the outcome to be so if we've got teamwork going on for example in um in a science lesson would we group a group of four introverted people together in one group to work on the task. We might also look at whether um, outward going or introverted, extroverted, introverted, they were primarily focused on the task and the outcome of the task or the relationships that people that they're with. And we might have a learning outcome that we want people to challenge each other's ideas. So in an ideal situation, I might as a teacher say, well, I'm going to put a group of four people together they're going to be a mix of introverts and extroverts in terms of their per, per, um, personality and how um, willing they are to communicate with each other, and work together. And I'm going to put somebody who's very strongly focused on the task and somebody very strongly focused on the relationships and just see how that dynamic plays out in that in that group work. Now, that, that's a very, very simple and basic example. But I would be pushed to know anybody that's been taught something like that. I might be looking at her class and say, you know, some behavioral issues. Let's have a look at your seating plan. Who's sitting next to who? You know, who's motivating who and who's putting other people, you know, other people back. And when she as a teacher is talking to a class and wanting to get the best out of her, um, her students, just, for example, a matter of pace. Mm -hmm. If somebody is, a, is an outgoing personality, they communicate quickly like me. Mm -hmm. If they're more of an introvert, then things slow right down. Now, I'm not looking at it at this point in time for the purpose of how a teacher might be trained in this. I think what I'm arguing is that there should be room and there should be policy that allows for this kind of teaching and personal development in the classroom. And one where a system is purely about compliance. This is what you're going to do. This is where you're going to sit, how you're going to behave, what you're going to do doesn't allow for any of those kinds of dynamics. And at the other end of the extreme, one where we let the child choose where they want to sit or what they want to do, or or maybe mix it up for for um, you know along the theology, the philosophy, sorry, of child-centered learning, but without regard to the fact that there are rules that need to be followed and there's a reward and behavioral system is equally as misguided. So I'm saying we need to set aside this bipolar type mentality in education and understand both in the implementation of policy, but also in the implementation of training that we are dealing with children who we want to bring into a system and send out the other side best prepared for life, whatever life they want to have in the adult world. Your ideas have developed from your observations and thoughts in school leadership and yeah. now your knowledge and experience of business. Absolutely. Can you... Can you just give us a brief example of where in business um, you've been able to help a, a, a company turn around staff behaviours or 
move from loss to profit. Can, by I, can, I, can I give you two examples? Can I, can I steal two examples? I'll let you have two. <laughs> okay, because I, I want to share an example with you that's based on people. Mm -hmm. And I want to share an example that's based on outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the outcomes one, actually, because, you know, um, team building and class building and relationship building is really, really important. But again, what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to achieve better learning so i'm gonna the analogy i'm going to use is better sales mm -hmm. so communication profiling is often used in sales um so this is a company i they, they'll be able to identify themselves but i'm never going to identify them that um sell hot tubs mm -hmm. and when i started working with them as a as a business mentor as a business mm -hmm. coach um they were asking me if i could help them on their marketing and what was going on with their marketing and when we started to look at the business, um, we realized that marketing wasn't the problem. They, they sold hot tubs at the back of a, of a garden center, um, a big one. So people would go there. They'd walk through the garden center. They, 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 they'd go to the, um, to the hot tub selling place, or they might find them online, et cetera. But these are people who are really interested in hot tubs. Mm -hmm. So they would show up. And they were only converting about 12% of the inquiries into sales. So we, I said, marketing's not your problem. The problem is that 88 out of every 100 don't buy anything from you. So the problem is sales. So we looked at communication profiling in the sales category. We said, right, okay, if somebody wants to buy a hot tub and they are an extrovert that is focused on success, then they want to buy the best hot tub. They want to buy a hot tub and they are an extrovert that's focused on people then they want to imagine how great they're going to look in that hot tub. They're going to be there with their friends. There's going to be bubbly flowing and all kinds of things going on that shouldn't be going on type thing. If they're an introvert focused on um, people, they want to know that um, with the small people, group of people that are going to share the hot tub, that it's going to be safe. It's going to be comfortable. You know, if, if anything goes wrong with it, it's, um, there, there are guarantees in place that are going to correct it. And if they're um, an introvert that's focused on um, information and detail, they're going to want to know the specifications. How many lights has it got? How often do you have to change the water? What temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So people have primary motivations for buying a hot tub. So if somebody's going to sell one effectively, they have to recognize which of those core four profiles I've just described the prospect is. So they can adapt their selling style to that and effectively have a greater chance of um, selling a hot tub. And you know, if you've got a 12% conversion rate and you improve that by 10%, you've just taken it up to 13.2, but it makes a massive impact. So it's all about relationships and understanding communication patterns. From a team building point of view, um, I was working, I am working with a, with, um, a large media type organization in Brighton. They've got quite a big team. Um, they're in a very fast and dynamic environment, um, digital downloads and record labels. And you can imagine through the pandemic how many changes they've undergone and the challenges. And that's in an industry that's already very dynamic. So they have their team meetings. Um, I've looked at the profiles of all of the, um, nearly said children there, all of the adults in the teams. And um, we noticed that people were being grouped together that were very similar in terms of their communication profile. So they weren't really challenging each other. Um, you won't, won't always necessarily want challenge. If we use the analogy in the classroom, there are certainly times when you do not want children challenging each other, but there are other times when you absolutely do. So we looked at this group and how they were grouping. They weren't challenging each other, so therefore everything was quite safe. And when we mixed up the groupings, um, we got some great ideas. And um, you know the company's shown itself to be far more effective. It's grown, it's continuing, it grew through the pandemic, it's continuing to grow in its revenues, just won new contracts in new areas that's not worked before, such as games, music, things like that. So when I started to recognize this and reflect back on my teaching days, I, initially my, my reflection was back on how I interacted as a school leader with my staff and how much better I could have done that. So for those that are watching, I apologize. So many times one gets it wrong because we're not aligning ourselves with the profile of the other person. But in the classroom, I think hopefully people can hear from my rather long answer that the analogy um, between adults and other human beings, namely the children in the classroom. So if I'm a classroom teacher 
and I'm convinced by what you're telling me and I want to move beyond the experience and the and the instinctive how do I know how can I recognize out of the perhaps 200 children who pass through my classroom a week and driven by the slavery of the bell and the one hour lesson or the one hour 10 minute lesson how do I recognize the communication that child a needs and child b needs it's a great it's a great question mark it's a great question so let's just dig into it the first thing is one needs to be allowed to recognize it mm. so that means that the setup in the school you know the, the the behavioral management system the reward system has got to have enough space to allow people to pursue this individuality side to it so you know, without that, there, there, there's no room for this. You know, if it's a strict compliance-based system, this is where you go. This is what you say. This is when you speak, heaven forbid, you know, and this is how you address your teacher, et cetera, et cetera. There is no room for that recognition. I think the answer to the other part lies in, in what we do as teachers anyway, and that's in being trained to do so. And 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 I haven't seen that training anywhere. I really haven't. Um. There may be aspects of it here and there, but I, I I haven't seen it. And when I've worked on this kind of philosophy in schools in the past, it's it's almost like a Damascus Road moment, not just for the leadership teams I've been working with, but for myself as well, as I kind of reflect. Um, a little bit more specific, your answer. Um, it depends to the degree. So I, I would argue that if you've got a basic understanding, what I call the Pareto principle understanding, if you can recognise the 20% of how someone communicates, and there is a quantitative as well as a qualitative aspect to this, then you're gonna get 80% of the improvement that you might be looking for. And any improvement is, is an improvement, you know, with, with, with schools, with, with outcomes, with grades, with, we're talking small numbers for, for large impact as, as any school leader would recognize. Um, me personally, when I was trained in this, I, my immediate, immediate reaction was, this is so complex, I'm never gonna get it. Um, I've, I've done so many hundreds of these things now. It's almost second nature. So um, with a little bit of training, I'd be able to walk into a room and say, right, extrovert or introvert, um, focused on tasks, focused on people, primarily primary motivators. We're all, all four of those things, by the way, in different contexts, but primary motivators. Um, that person speaks faster. I'm going to adapt my speed accordingly. That's very slow. I'm going to adapt accordingly. You know, they're interested about how they look, so I'm not going to show them up in class. They want to be shown up because they've done well, so I am going to show them up in class, you know. And and it becomes another, I was going to say instinctive, but it's a bit more than instinctive. It's informed instinctive skill that a teacher develops and will continue to, to develop um, over time. Okay, so within the educational context at the moment, yeah. the the every everything has to have an evidence base yes there has to be research um we are i think correctly moving beyond the uh, the sort of half-baked philosophical approach that perhaps marked the uh, 60s 70s and 80s and we're and we're looking for rigor what is the evidence base around uh communication profiling in education well Ge let's start generally because you've been using it in in industry but i'd be interested to know if it's been applied i would i would i would encourage anybody watching or reading this to to, to go and look for themselves because it, it is phenomenal mm -hmm. you no know, it's it's not it's not um an automatic wand it's not an answer to all things but communication profiling has been used particularly mm -hmm. the format that that i use mm -hmm. um for since the early 1920s, it's been used um, internationally. It's corporate. It's used in psychology. It's used in relationships and team building. Um, I can't um, quote you um, right here and now um, specific papers, but it, it, there's been a massive study. And the reason I said to you in education is because it seems to me almost as though the education sector has completely missed the bus on this. Mm -hmm. It's not even been on their radar. And that's the thing that has puzzled me the most especially having spent 30 years in education it didn't come across my radar um and i understand um evidence uh, you know that uh, things need to be evidence-led in, in in education and i'm um more than happy to be involved in any educational trials in in this country as well but let's just use a bit of common sense for the moment 
let's bring it down to the evidence of our own experience as human beings, as adults. If we can't communicate effectively with the person opposite us, how can we expect to have good outcomes, whatever that outcome might be, whether it's developing relationship, developing trust, selling to them, getting better behavior out of them, getting married to them or turning them into a lifelong significant partner. How can we do that if we don't have a certain degree of understanding of the communication profile? And if we ignore all that, then we're trusting to chance. And I think my lamentation of the education system is that is largely what we have done. We look at a group of pupils, we look at their profile, and we say we expect this set of results out of them. There are going to be some outliers. We'll put them in the best system we can possibly get, and we'll get those results. My argument is, let's have a system that, are, that is effective for the child, but let's have a teacher that is skilled. I'm not asking them to be a psychologist, but skilled enough to understand the child that's in front of them. And let's have some training in place right at, you know, initial teacher training level and all the way through to help us become better at doing that. And let's have educational policy that allows educational leaders to have freedom to look at their own school context, situation, and desired outcomes and implement it and implement um, development of training accordingly. So just w one final point then. For the, um, for the school leader watching this, if they are very persuaded by your passion, your enthusiasm, your energy, and your experience, what are the it risks comes for them across, in trying something out? Sorry, I interrupted you. What are, what are the risks for a school leader, a school leader, um, who wants to try this and to go for it? Oh, right. Um, the answer is, I, I guess, they could be quite substantial. Hmm. You know, the, the reality is. Uh, but so could the reward. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a, when I was a, um, appointed as a secondary head, my first substantive headship, uh, it was in a county where um, there was very little external input into the education system. The, most of the head teachers had, had come from that particular county and were circulating around. Um, I noticed in my colleagues um, a wide range of different profiles from the risk takers, the rule benders, to the compliance. And I suppose that that adds fuel to my argument about our communication profile. You know, head teachers form most of these key four areas that I've been describing. Um, and um, I went in to, I, I, I as a matter of choice, having worked in highly successful schools and challenging schools alike as a teacher, I made a conscious decision that I wanted to work in a challenging environment. Because for me personally, that was where there was the potential for the greatest reward. And, and other people would see things differently through their own filters. Um, and I was highly motivated by the initial success that I'd achieved. But it did come with risks. It came with pushback. Um, not, not, not this particular aspect, because I, I didn't work on this in the schools, but being a head teacher comes with risks. It comes with a risk of pushback. I was taught on my MPQH, and I've never forgotten it, that if you go in trying to be the head that's going to please all people, you can never succeed. It's a bell curve. And the bell curve is described to me as the right-hand side where people think pretty much everything you do is wonderful and think you're great and highly effective. And on the left-hand side, there are those that think you're absolutely useless and rubbish and you don't have a clue what you're doing. And then there's those in the middle that are largely neutral and open to persuasion one way or another as to what whether you're doing, you know, it's the right thing. Headship, I don't need to tell you colleagues, headship is an incredibly lonely and isolated place to be, even though it appears that it isn't because you're surrounded by other head teachers and governing bodies and trusts and all those kind of things in place. But the reality is that it is. So it takes bravery. It does take bravery. And one has to decide for themselves whether the risk of moving away from government policy, whatever that may be of the day, and it has changed so many times, as we both know, is a risk that somebody's prepared to take. So I don't have a simple answer to that. I think that's down to individuals. But I am passionate about it, as you can see. And I do believe that our purpose is to be there for the children. And not just so they can learn what they need to learn, but they who they can be, who 
they want to be. We One of the things that I think we've got wrong in the education system, um, and we'll see whether this makes the notes or the video in the end, Mark, but one of the things I think we've got wrong in the education is that we teach children in order to be successful, they have to achieve a certain collection of grades and a certain collection of subjects. And we don't look at who they are as human beings, the B bit. So the first bit, the grades, the subjects, that's the doing, what they do in order to be successful. So we teach our children, and I've seen this in business, if you want to be successful, you have to work hard. I'm going to repeat that. If you want to be successful, you have to work hard. Because so many people will hear that and go, of course that's true. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. If you want to be successful, you have to think, Sometimes differently, smart, creatively, innovatively. Because when people go into business and their business is struggling, they think the answer is to put in more hours, more hours, more hours, work hard to do more. And what suffers then is relationships and family, personal health, mental well-being. Head teachers will recognize some of those. What we need to do is work smarter. So we look at the what we're doing, absolutely. Well, are we doing the right courses? Are we putting in the right effort? Is it correctly structured and motivated? And who we are being and who we are learning to be as we go through the school system and into adulthood. Gavin, thank you very much. I think what you've done in this interview is, again, I'm going to use the word passionately, communicated uh, a challenge to all teachers and a challenge to current policy. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more about your project as it extends. And we're looking for those brave schools who will come on board and work with you. So thank you very much, Gavin Bellamy. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. And can I just say, in all the time I've known you, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> right, let's pause it there. Right, OK. Um...